Hey everyone, and welcome back to ILS Concepts for Electronics Technicians, Lesson 4, Glide Slope RF Pattern Development. In this lesson, we'll discuss antennas above a ground plane and the null reference glide slope antenna arrangement, which is one of three main types of glide slope image arrays. All right, so the techniques used to develop the glide slope RF pattern are quite different than that of the localizer. So for this lesson, we're going to spend some time to first understand how the radiation pattern of an antenna above ground responds at different heights above a ground plane. Let's begin the discussion with a theoretical point source antenna suspended in free space. Notice the RF energy is spreading evenly in all directions. When an antenna is within a ground plane, the RF energy will reflect from that plane. When this occurs, the reflected energy in red combines to the direct RF energy shown in blue. In this example, the antenna is a quarter wavelength above the ground plane. Let's look at the phase of these signals at various points around the antenna. The resulting RF pattern has the most signal strength directly overhead while tapering off to the sides. In other words, the antenna has a power gain directly overhead due to its quarter wave height above the ground. Glide slopes with antennas arranged on a vertical tower, also known as image arrays. And in electromagnetics, an image antenna is an electrical mirror image of an antenna element formed by the radio waves reflecting from a ground plane. And if we can imagine for a moment, removing the ground plane, this mirror antenna would be an inverse antenna in equal distance from the original. Looking again at an ideal point source antenna mounted a quarter wavelength above ground, we see the resulting radiation pattern. At a half wavelength above ground, we can get this pattern. And at three quarters wavelength above ground, we get this pattern. And finally, at a full wavelength above ground, we get this pattern. In summary, as we raise the antenna, we develop more lobes that are narrower. Also, raising the antenna lowers the nulls. Conversely, lowering the antenna raises those nulls. These principles apply to glide slope RF pattern development and how the proper glide path angle is achieved. In the introductory examples, we used a theoretical point source antenna that radiated equally in all directions. However, image array glide slope antennas are highly directional. Let's identify some of their design components. The first of which are the radiating elements, which consist of three horizontally polarized dipoles in a broadside collinear array configuration, which provide horizontal directivity. Next, the glide slope antenna uses corner reflectors to provide the vertical directivity for the dipole driven elements. Lastly, RF couplings are located internally near the base of the antenna to pick up a sample of the radiated energy for monitoring purposes. Here we can see the null reference glide slope with two antennas mounted on a 40 foot tower. Behind the tower is the shelter containing the transmit and monitoring equipment. Let's begin by discussing the CSB RF pattern developed from the lower antenna, which is positioned a quarter wavelength above ground for a typical three degree desired angle. Now, as the RF signals from the direct and reflected waves meet above ground, the path lengths are such that the signals begin to combine. With this lower antenna height, the signals between the direct and reflected waves add together, resulting in a signal maximum at three degrees. At an angle above this, the signal strength begins to reduce. The 
Let's now discuss SBO RF pattern development. The SBO antenna is twice the height of the lower CSB antenna, or half a wavelength above ground, for the desired glide path angle. In other words, the null reference glide slope has an antenna height ratio of 2 to 1. Due to the increased height of the antenna, the vectors arrive in such a way as to create a signal maximum at approximately 1.5 degrees below the desired 3 degree glide path angle. And take note of the relative phase of each lobe in the SBO pattern. Here we see the first null occur where the previously discussed CSB signal was maximum. Again, this is due to the increased height of the SBO antenna. At approximately 4.5 degrees above glide path angle, the RF waves arrive in such a way as to create another signal maximum. And at an angle of 6 degrees, a second null occurs. Now it's important to note that additional nulls and lobes occur above this pattern. However, aircraft flying at those altitudes would not be on a final approach to a runway and likely not tuned into an ILS at all. Recall that 150 Hz predominates below the glide path and 90 Hz predominates above. We will now see how the audio phase relationships of the 90 and 150 Hz combines with the lobe phases produced by the antenna array to allow for this result. This again assumes CSB and SBO are properly phased to each other. And here we see those relative RF lobe phases in magenta. RF lobe phase relationship affects those transmitter audio phase relationships. And here we can see the 90 and 150 Hz audio phase signs remain unchanged in the positive lobes. However, audio phase is reversed in the oppositely phased lobe. Basically, all that's happened is the SBO lobe above glide path has reversed its audio phase. CSB then combines or space modulates with SBO shown here by placing the CSB audio below each SBO audio. And here we have the resultant audio tones. Above path 90 Hz has vectorially added together with 150 Hz canceling. Below path 90 Hz vectorially cancel and the 150 Hz add. As you can see, the height of the antennas plays an important role in establishing the glide path angle, and it can be calculated as follows. We begin with calculating the height of the lower antenna. We first take the speed of light in feet per second divided by 4, then divide that, that by the sine of our desired angle, which is 3 degrees for this example, minus any slope for this example, we'll assume that the ground is perfectly flat in front of the glide slope antenna. Uh, times the glide slope frequency and in this example I chose a frequency at the center of the ILS band of 334.4 megahertz. The result gives us an initial height of 14.05 feet for the lower antenna. This means you would position the antenna on the tower at this height as measured from the base of the tower to the midpoint of the center dipole. However, flight inspection is the final method for fine-tuning these heights. This calculation simply gives you a very good starting point. And to find the upper antenna height, it's simply twice the height of the lower antenna, or 28.1 feet in this case. The next topic is antenna offsets. As an aircraft gets very near the runway, its distance from the lower antenna decreases more than the distance from the upper antenna, known as proximity phase error. This results in approaching aircraft instruments appearing less sensitive to changes in height. To see these path length differences between both antennas, imagine a line drawn from the runway center line to each antenna. It would be seen that if no antenna offset were used, the lower antenna would have a slightly shorter path length than the other. Therefore, moving the upper antenna closer to the runway will compensate for this. The formula for determining the upper offset is as follows. 
take the upper antenna height squared minus the lower antenna height squared divided by two times the distance of the glide slope tower from runway centerline. If we use our previous height calculations and a typical glide slope distance from centerline of 500 feet, we get a result of 0.59 feet for the upper antenna offset. Taking a closer look at this offset, we can see the offset is relative to the center dipole of the lower antenna to the center dipole of the upper antenna and would be moved towards the runway. As you now know, image array glide slopes rely on reflected RF energy to form the vertical radiation pattern. This area of reflection is also known as the Fresnel zone. Now, the exact theory of Fresnel zones are quite complicated, however, the concept here is easy to understand. Fresnel zone theory simply looks at a line from A to B and at the space around that line that contribute to what is arriving at point B. Some waves travel directly from A to B, while others travel on paths off axis, which reach the receiver by reflection. In the context of the glide slope, the changing aircraft's position along the glide path results in changing reflection points on the ground. Because of this, the ground plane must be sufficiently graded for smoothness with a relatively flat lateral and longitudinal slope through all possible reflection points received by the aircraft receiver on the glide path. Therefore, the null reference glide slope would need approximately 1,500 to 2,000 feet of appropriately graded ground plane with the following surface smoothness for the aircraft to receive the reflected part of the signal predictably and smoothly throughout the approach. For this reason, this area is referred to as a critical area and should be protected from things such as buildups of snow and ice, construction material, and aircraft and vehicle operations. And that concludes the Glide Slope RF Pattern Development lesson. Thanks for watching.